Steve's study notes are available prior to each week's video and a key version the following week. See the links on the YouTube page for the video or on the Encourager's website. You're going. Greetings. We're glad, so glad that you're here. It's fantastic. You know, as we were listening to the service this morning about, uh, you know, uh, well, just Casey came up and the whole thing again about the need for people, you know, to help in, in, in the churches. But I'm just so glad so many for this class are so, so generous with your time. I want to say thank you. Really appreciate that. But it makes me remember, uh, you know, I spent 40 years uh, pastoring a church in California and I just realized how important, you know, people, it's the people, it isn't just the pastor and staff, it's us together because that's, that's God's call for each and every one of us, it really is. So uh, we're involved in, in ministry, praise God for it. Well, we want to continue in our uh, study of the purpose driven life, just a little reflex on it. but. We, uh, remember, we, we started out by just reminding ourselves how important it is that you understand there is a purpose to life. Really very important. And if you haven't gotten the book yet, this is your book. All right, Purpose Driven Life. I encourage you, I really do, I encourage you to find, maybe it's an old copy someplace, so borrow it from somebody, but, but read it. I think, I think what Rick put together here is really, worthwhile. But um, I want to start off with a story. And I, it's a little bit of a strange story, but actually, I, actually I, I was going through a lot of my notes because you know our church in California, we went through the 40-day uh, purpose-driven life study in, uh, in uh, 2003 in, in California. And uh, so anyway, I looked at a bunch of notes and stuff. I found this story. So this is one of the ripped stories, okay? This is what he says. It's a true story, and he, he got it supposedly out of the, the Chicago Tribune, I think in 2001 or so, but the Chicago Tri Tribune. A true story written about a guy named Bill Mallory, all right? Bill Mallory decided to travel to India to ask the question, what is the true purpose of life? Well, he asked the gurus and all the people over there, and they basically came back with the answer, well, take time to meditate. Sit there, and as you meditate, you know, look within you, and you will find the purpose of life. And uh, that didn't satisfy him. He says, you know, that's, you know, look within myself, you know, all... I, I don't think, I, I trust that. So he comes back to, Kelly, to, uh, to the United States. So now he's driving this car and <clears throat> he, he, he drives past a gas station filled with gas at the Chevron gas station. And the Chevron gas station says, as you travel, ask us. So he thought, well, I'm a traveler, so I'm gonna ask them the question. So there's a gas station attendant and he says, what is the true meaning of life? And the young guy looks at him and he says, well, he says, you know, this is the, I haven't been on this job very long and I don't think our training manual taught us the answer to that question. So he goes to, keeps driving, and every time he sees a Chevron gas station, he gets out of his car, asks him that question, what is the true meaning of life? And these are some of the answers, you know, that he gets. And one guy says to him, well, you know, I'm not a very religious guy, but uh, you know, you really ought to ask that of a pastor. You know, so I thought, too, that's a pretty good answer. But anyway, so one guy, he comes to him and he asks that question, what's the true meaning of life? And the guy looks at him, winks at him, and he says, and then what does he do? He gives him, gives him an application for a Chevron credit card. Anyway, you say, well, what kind of a dumb story? What's that all about? Well, the whole point, I guess what Rick was trying to say with all of this is that, you know, the whole point of the story is that don't try to look for the purpose of life at a gas station or in some bookstore where, you know, you read all these self-help books or, or you watch, uh, you know, Oprah Winfrey and she'll have some authors on there and so forth. He said, if you really want to know 
the true purpose of life, where do you go? You go to the creator or you go to the owner's manual. He said that's, that's where you, you have to go. True meaning of life, you really have to come back and say, God, why did you make us? Why are we here? What's the purpose of life? And it's a great place to look. It's read your Bible. Read your Bible. God, and this is the marvelous thing. This is what I, I have appreciated all the years that I've been able to, to, uh, to preach and so forth. But as Christians, God has made himself known. And <clears throat> you, you wonder about that. What do you do? <clears throat> you look at the owner's manual and you find out it has historical roots. What is it rooted in? A history of a strange people called the Jews. Read all, their whole history. And their whole history was looking forward to someone. Someone's a coming. Someone's a coming. The Messiah. Until you get into the New Testament, you suddenly realize the time has been fulfilled and he came. So we have the privilege. We, we know what it is, but we sometimes don't know okay and that's why I think this is such a great opportunity you know for us to uh, to study this so remember what 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 Rick has laid out he says and and again understand another thing the first book that I read of Rick Warren was a purpose-driven church and I don't mind telling you that was a blessing for me as a young pastor in Temecula California I mean, he, that really helped me tremendously because he found five purposes that the church needs to have in the forefront. Why are we here as a church? And um, so where do we start? So we're, we're looking now at five purposes and um, I wanna prime the pump by reading uh, Psalm 100. And let's think about what is this first purpose that we need to be looking at, Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful psalms. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise, give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. What do you hear? What is the psalmist calling believers to do? What's the focus? Shout to the Lord. Shout to the Lord, what do we call that? Praise. Praise, praise. another word. Worship. Worship. worship 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 you're right so worship and you know there's many other passages that I I could uh, read but each one has to do with worship so you know we we look at our, our purpose what is our purpose why are we here well actually we are here to worship God that's number one purpose God planned us for his pleasure. I'm going to say each one of these, and I hope as time goes on, you'll memorize all, all seven. I mean, I really want you to think about that. God planned us for his pleasure. Now, so let's talk about this now. What then is worship? Well, I want to refer us to a, another passage. This is in um, Matthew in uh, Matthew chapter, no, Mark, Mark chapter 12, Mark chapter 12. I'm so used to reading this uh, same story in, in uh, Matthew, but he, I, I like this one here. So now I'm in Mark chapter 12, verse 29. So it's the same story. This one person comes to Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And this is what Jesus says, verse 29. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God, now listen to this, with all your heart, 
with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. He says, you love God, that's the way you need to love him. Love the Lord your God. Um, now, when you think about that, so what then is worship? Well, we're going to kind of look at each one of these points here, you might say. But um, the first point is this. Uh, you want to worship with your mind, all right? Your heart as a new heart, but with your mind. It takes your mind. So the, my first point here on, on our outline is worship is focusing my attention. Get that now. My attention on God. All right? So thoughtfully, that's kind of what we're looking at. My attention means that if I'm going to worship God, that means he wants my attention. Point number A. God wants your focus, all right? When we think about this, you just realize it's not a matter of, uh, you know, like in the, um, in India, Hindu religions, there's a mantra. And they sit down there, and, you know, fingers are all nicely positioned certain ways. And, uh, and they repeat a mantra, a word. Well, and oftentimes it's just plain senseless. That's not, what, that's not worship. God is saying, I want your mind. I want your thought. I want you to think about me. Why is that? Okay? Why is that? Well, here, let me give you another great verse here. In um, Psalm 139, listen to what it says here in the first three verses. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit down, when I rise. You perceive my, my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out by lying down. And you are familiar with all my ways. Now, you read that and, and try to think about this. Because, you know, you, you kind of read it from the, from the astronomy point of view. You ever, you ever see some of these programs? All the ma majestic planets and stars and things and there's that little dot sitting right there and that's earth and you think come on god you you think about me i I'm, you can, i can't even see that little speck over there and i'm part of that and what the lord is saying yes and when you get to understand science all the planets and everything there all have a purpose and the focal point there is that little speck over there. But God knows you that well. He knows your, your innards, your outers, your whatever you're doing, and, and your, your thought life and so forth. But he is focused on you. And he'd like you to focus on him. And all his majesty. I think that's such a phenomenal thought. You know, but with that, make sure that you understand something else, what worship is not. And that's why I appreciate Rick's words here as well. In, on um, page 65, he says this. <clears throat> worship is far more than music. Now, this is where we are often today. Well, I sure enjoyed the music. I sure enjoyed our worship this morning. It was great. Well, excuse me now. Don't limit worship to just music. Listen what more, what more he says. Worship is far more than music. For many people, worship is just a synonym for music. They say, at our church, we have worship first, then the teaching. This is a big misunderstanding. Every part of church service is an act of worship. Praying, scripture reading, singing, confession, silence, it's all worship. Even worse, he says, worship is often misused to refer to a particular style of music. Well, first we sang a hymn, then praise and worship. Let me just interject here. I, I went through all of this, okay? And in our church, you know, we started in 68 and well, great, you know, then in the 70s, 
we were growing and we went to two services and uh, we had the eight o'clock service and what became the popular style of music? Well, Chuck Smith, you know, he had his style of music. And uh, you know, that we got people in our church who, who loved, you know, that style of music. So the next thing I know, we're almost having worship wars. Have you heard that term, worship wars? Well, I went through it, okay. So, you know, because, and then as, as, as we, you know, as the years go by, then I'll have people come to me and say, well, you know, I try to mingle them together a little bit, you know. Well, you know that our service this Sunday, we had more of these rinky tink songs with the, you know, with the guitars. We had more of the, that style instead of the good old hymns. I thought, oh boy, here we go. And then others later on would complain, well, we had those old staunchy songs, and wait a minute, you know what we forgot? Worship is not for us. Worship is for God. Make big mistake, and that's often what we do. We'll listen to, you know, but, well, I didn't like it this morning. Well, wait, wait a minute. Worship was there not for you. Worship was there for the Lord. You are then to give him your praise and worship. God wants your attention. Okay, start with that. But then we say, well, how? Well, again, we have to realize often we have a problem. Let's take a peek here at Romans chapter 8. What do I have here? Romans 8 verse 7. Scripture says here, Verse 6, the mind controlled by the sinful nature is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. So what's often our problem? Our problem is our sinful nature. See, that's, that's the big issue. But, we come to worship God, but we take our selfishness in there. We want it to please me. So Rick says some pretty good things here on um, page 70. He says, uh, he says, uh, hey, we've got some good news here. <laughs> He was getting ready for me to read this. You know that, don't you? I, I, was, I was getting ready, I tell you. He says, uh, <laughs> all right. He says, God smiles. Okay, he says, well, it's five acts. You just talk about three here. He says, that makes God smile. God smiles when we love him supremely. And God made you to love him. And he longs for you to love him back. God smiles when you trust him completely. Now, even when it doesn't make sense, you know, we learn to trust him, and that's really a part of, of worship. Uh, trusting is an act of worship. God smiles when we obey him wholeheartedly. And, you know, you think about that, that's all a part of worship, why? Because worship is not limited to the hour that you spend here. That's not worship, that's, that's just a, an expression where the God, people of God come together. They express giving thanks and praise to God. It's fellowship. It's fellowship. It is everything you do. That's what worship is. And I'll, I'll, I'll speak more as, as, as we do that. It's everything. So we realize then how, well, by trusting God, by obeying Him, by surrendering to Him, okay, he wants our focus. But then secondly, you must choose to focus on God. That's point number B. You choose. Uh, you know, you must do something to shift your focus because, you know, our focus primarily, I, I know, I've, I've been that way too. When the morning starts, I'm thinking already, well, what do I got to do today? You know, I got this and that. And all. My focus is totally on myself. And I've just sh shared with you before, 
I learned, I have learned over the years to start the day and say, good morning, Lord. What's on your agenda today? I want to be a part of it. Somehow that focus of the Lord, we have to choose to focus on him. And I can't express it any better than saying, start with some kind of a daily, a daily worship. It may be only, you know, I, I, I tell people, uh, a spiritual seven up. So you got, you can spend seven minutes, you know, before or after you shower, whatever you do, and uh, just focus on the Lord. Lord, what's on your agenda today? And you may look out the window and say, oh, praise God, it rained. Look, oh, thank you, Lord, how gracious you are. You know, start with Him. What blessings. So you start, develop a habit. And maybe, maybe that habit, you start to find a place. And in, in the Old Testament, there was only one place where they could really worship God, and that was in the temple. But now God seeks those to worship Him. We are the temple now. Let God speak to you. Value what God values and so forth. So, and then, so point number one is establish a daily time with God. Point number two under, a, under B, develop constant conversation with God. And uh, you say, well, how do I do that? I've got to stop. I mean, no. I mean, as you're driving down the road, I'll tell you something. Um, I'm just so grateful I didn't have to pass those trucks and cars where that big accident happened on the freeway, you know. That was awful. I saw one video, some, some person literally just put the, put the phone up on, the, on their, their uh, window and they kept driving and saw these trucks and bashing people and oh, it was awful. But what I learned, times like that, I learned to pray. I learned to be able to say, oh, Lord, protect these people, or Lord, help the, the, uh, the ambulance drivers or whoever, but pray for whatever situation is there, doing things constantly. And I also realized something, you'll get a kick out of this, Angela, but uh, when, I, uh, when we go to the, the, uh, uh, the gym, what's that place called again? The Y, that's right. <laughs> You'll get used to this, you know. I get my, I have to have my audience participate. But anyway, when you go to the Y, you know, so here's some guys getting stuck, put into the baggage area over there. Uh, he, what is he doing? He's, he's on the phone. I said, you know something? We're going to establish a rule here that you have to leave your phone in the uh, narthex, you know, in, the, in the lobby. He says, yeah, you can't have a good exercise in and be on the phone at the same time, you know. But anyway, but it just shows you how glued we are to the phones. I, keep th I thought to myself, well, why can't we do that? Being reminded just to have a prayer time with the Lord. Every time I pull out my, my cell phone and I, I gotta talk to my wife or I gotta do this or that, I gotta remember, you know, Lord, I, I don't wanna you know, ignore you. I want you to know how much I, I love you and how much I appreciate you. Constant conversation with the Lord. Let it be that way, okay? So, establish a daily, daily time with the Lord. Develop constant conversation with God. Now, now we're on point number two. What is worship? Well, as we read there in Mark, you know, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your, and heart and mind, and soul, okay? Your soul. Well, that's more the... Uh, emotional expression you see that's that's your soul well worshiping is expressing my affection to God uh, learn to say I love you now I have to be honest uh, as I think about hearing that I love you I have to be honest in, in my home growing up remember now this was in the 40s and the 50s so that was a long time ago I never heard my parents say I love you to each other. You know, I, I knew they did in the sense of, you know, their, just their mannerisms and so forth, but I never heard them say I love you. And so I, I, I think back on myself, it, it, it took a little bit for me to learn to say I love you. 
but I, I always laugh when I, when I think about that as well. So, so here you are, here we are in, uh, in junior high school. What's, what's the big game that we played in junior high school? Well, it was at that time, us little boys, we started to look at little girls. And uh, we were hoping that that certain little girl liked me, okay, liked me. But I wouldn't ask her, do you like me? No, I would think about sending an emissary, you know what I mean by that? A go-between. And that go-between talks to her and he says, do you like Steve? And uh, well, that was kind of risky, you know, what if she said no? And I, I asked her myself, well, that'd be pretty painful. But if I had somebody else ask her, then tell me, you know, not quite as painful. So that's how we start with that game saying, I love you. But it's important that we learn to say, I love you. Why is that? Well, let me read this verse. This is very, uh, I just love this. Very short, simple verse. John, 1 John 4, 19. Here it is. We love because he first loved us. So, you know, we don't have to wait around and say, Lord, um, you know, do you love me? <laughs> you know, yes, he does. He tells you that right away. And he says, if you don't believe me, I'll point you to the cross where my son died for you. And uh, so he said, I love you. He's not going to decide at that point, I'm going to accept you or reject you. He already says, I love you. He accepts you. So God said it first to you. Now, that's point number one. God said it to you first. Now, the second thing here, God wants you to know him and to love him. He wants you to know him and to love him. Now, in Hosea, Old Testament here, See if I can find this quickly. Hosea 6, verse 6. This is what God said to his people. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. It was basically saying, you know, I, I want you to, to know me. I just don't want your sacrifices. I want you to acknowledge me that I do love you. That's more important than just giving me sacrifices, some ritual. And, um, you know, I think that's really important. We, we've got to learn to spend time with him. Really. And I, I think too often it's an afterthought, you know, or well, I'll think about him one day a week when I go to church. No, no, wait a minute now. Think about it on a daily basis because he wants you to spend time with him. And uh, I remember when I was in, in seminary, I was reading, a, a, what would you call it, a philosopher and also a theologian. His name was Frederick Schleiermacher. What do I, Struckman's is pretty close, I know, but <laughs> Schleiermacher, you know, I like that. So, reading that, he says, um, he says, we've got to learn what worship is. And he says, now, worship is a lot like going to the theater, isn't it? So he says, who are the main characters in the theater? Well, you've got the actors, prompters, you know, making sure the actors know their lines and stuff. And he says, the audience. Well, he says, you know, too often we go to church thinking the same thing. We go to church, who are the actors? Well, it must be the pastor and the choir. They're doing all the stuff up front. Who's the prompter? Well, it must be God, because God is prompting the pastor to say what he needs to say. So the actors is the congregation. He says, that's not worship at all. He says, you've got to understand something. The actors, he says, first of all, is not the pastor. The actors are the congregation. He says, the prompter is God. Okay, the prompter is God. And now, 
the no 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 I'm sorry I got that I got that, got that one wrong the audience is God the prompter is the preacher now think about this this is true worship we are the actors we are living our lives the preacher's job is to prompt the people to live a godly lifestyle help them to understand what it means to be a Christian so I logged in my brain I thought you know he's absolutely right and the trouble with is we so many people come to church with the idea they are the audience boy I hope God is prompting that preacher so that he's saying the right things and no 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 the prompter is the preacher speaking to us the congregation because God is seeing us okay does that make sense <laughs> it's a weak nod there you know <laughs> I don't know boy <laughs> so anyway but the whole point is you know we've got to learn to say I love you to God and, and express it to him I love you Lord um, he said it to you first he wants you to know him and to love him and the only way you can really do that is to spend time with him so the point number B then is God doesn't want your duty he wants your desire he doesn't want your duty well I better spend time with him now wait a minute now think of this as a love relationship you know if if I did that to my wife I think we would have got a divorce a long time ago <laughs> you know but learning to say honey I love you and learning to listen and spending time with that person you know feeds the love that's what's important so it's God seeks a personal relationship with you doesn't want your duty wants your desire you know here's an interesting verse and I remember when I first read well I first really studied it <laughs> really got me thinking in Exodus chapter 34 verse 14 Here's uh, what this says. Uh, Do not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. You know, when I first read that, jealous, I thought that was kind of a negative thing. God is jealous. Well, when you really think about it, if a person really loves someone, and that person isn't paying that much attention to him or some other stuff, another one's trying to crowd in on this, you know, he gets jealous. It's because of his love. And God revealed himself in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me. He's a jealous God. He loves you so much that he doesn't want anything to come between your love and his it's important we've got to recognize that so the question then you know uh, too often uh, the, the problem is that we're often too busy we're busy we're busy we're busy well wait a minute now are you too busy to spend time with the one who loves you so much the one who gave his life for you you know we have to think about that wait a minute maybe i am too busy and then down the bottom of the page, express ex uh, affection by giving yourself to him. You know, here's where we really have to start. You see, Romans 6, 13 reminds us of this very thing. Romans, here we go. Romans 6. find you in here mm -hmm. thought I had it actually marked out but I didn't <laughs> anyway here we go Romans 6 13 uh, all right let me start at verse 11 
In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its evil desires. 13, do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves, and really in there, completely to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Uh, the whole point here is you cannot really love God in the sense of a sense of worship if you don't offer yourself as a living sacrifice. You have to start there. Worship has to start right there. You present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, that verse says. That's Romans 12, 1. Our spiritual worship, remember now, isn't just going to church, singing a few hymns, you know, have a little devotion at home. No, it's you realize now, start your day off. Invite him to walk with you through the whole day. Really, the whole day. That leads me now to my third point here. And that is, you know, worship God involves your mind, it means your attention. It involves your emotions, your affection, but also your abilities. So worship is using my abilities for God with all your strength. Well, Think about that. Uh, love shows itself practically. That's point number eight. Um, it has to be more than sweet words or, you know, a few religious things. This is something picked up in, in, in Rick's book here in 105. Here we go. 105. He says, God is pleased when our worship is practical. The Bible says, offer your bodies, living sacrifices, holy, pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Why does God want your body? Why doesn't he say, offer your spirit? Because without your body, you can't do anything on this planet. In eternity, you will receive a new, improved, upgraded body. But while you're here on earth, God says, Give me what you've got. He's just being practical about worship. You have heard people say, well, I can't make it to the meeting tonight, but I'll be with you in spirit. Listen to what he says. Do you know what that means? Nothing. It's worthless. As long as you're on earth, your spirit can only be where your body is. <laughs> That's pretty good. If your body isn't there, neither are you. In worship, we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Now, we usually associate the concept of sacrifice with something dead, but God wants you to be living sacrifice. He wants you to live for him. However, the problem with living sacrifices is they can crawl off the altar. Did you get that? <laughs> it didn't come through, did it? <laughs> so the, the Bible says we need to be living sacrifice. And he says the problem with living sacrifices, they can crawl off the altar. In other words, we don't like the sacrifice business. And we often do that. We sing onward Christian soldiers on Sunday and then go A-W-O-L on Monday. <laughs> I thought that was priceless. Read it, okay? <laughs> oh, I love it. Anyway, so the whole point again is, you know, you know, what, what God is interested in is, is us being available. And again, worship is not just going to church, singing songs. It's everything we do. And here's a precious verse in Colossians chapter 3, 
Listen to this. Chapter 3, verse 17. Of 16, he's, he's talking about worship. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs of the Spirit, singing to God and gratitude in your hearts. Okay, that sounds like our familiarity with worship. But then he says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to him, the Father, God, through him. Now, that's worship. Everything we do is a part of worship, giving honor and glory and praise to the Lord. So love shows itself practically, and then also love is demonstrated by your priorities. You know, your worship, you worship whatever gets your primary attention. You know what's fascinating when, when you study um, geography, history, people, societies, and so forth? Every society, every type of people have a tendency to worship. Just look at look at the different different cultures, nations, you know the I spent uh, two weeks in, in Papua New Guinea uh, visiting my daughter and son-in-law when they were there working with Wycliffe. And I spent two weeks there in this little village called Epme, and it was interesting to me. You know, here they are in you know, Papua New Guinea, but they also worshiped. You know, so some were, you know, atheists or some were, you know, uh, believed in spirit worlds and all this kind of stuff. And there are a whole group of them that actually went to the Catholic Church. But the interesting thing was, they all have a sense that there's something greater that we worship. Study, study geography and history and in society, it's amazing to me. Which shows you that there is an inward awareness that God created a spiritual vacuum in every being that we want to fill. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing. So whatever gets your attention, that is what you will end up worshiping. So what we want to do then as, as believers is really focus on the Lord. You know, get to know him because you know he loves you. He loves you first. So give him your attention. And then learn to say I love you to him and see and appreciate all that he has done around us and then respond with your life. Now, we often spend a lot of time uh, early in, in life, what, what's God's will for my life? And we always think about a career. And I went through that too, you know. But I begin to realize it doesn't matter whether you're a truck driver, uh, um, you know, CPA, or uh, whatever, you know, whatever your job is, fly airplanes or, you know, whatever. Just, just be a mom at home, take care of your kids. That is where you express your love for the Lord and recognize that He's a part of your life. That's the beauty of it. So make it your goal to please God. Make it your goal. And let that goal be get to know him, love him, and let him use your carcass, okay? <laughs> you know, present to the Lord a living, I always say, I present my carcass to you, Lord. So here I am. And use my body for your glory, for your service. But that begins with worship, acknowledging who he is okay so if I am planned for God's pleasure then I need to respond to him with my attention my mind my affection my soul and my abilities my strength make sense any question just throw something at me anything <laughs> get you thinking here okay all right I appreciate that. Let me close in prayer. 
Lord, we want to express our affection for you. We want to tell you we love you and uh, how privileged we are as a people that we've come to know you. We've come to realize that to know you is to understand that you've revealed yourself to us. And what a marvelous re revelation through the scriptures, but seeing it in a historical foundation is in the person of Jesus Christ. How do we know what God is like? We look at Jesus. Thank you for making yourself known. But thank you also that you've enabled us to know you by your Holy Spirit and to live for you through your strength. Thank you, Father. We pray your blessing on each of us as we venture out into this uh, next week. It's a gift. So, Lord, let us use that gift, that time, with, uh, with respect and realize that here are opportunities in which to serve you, but also to express our worship. Thank you. Go with each of us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate you being here.